Father in heaven, we are blessed to be able to come together as a church body, a church family, to worship and praise and honor you and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we are so thankful for any and all churches and denominations, Lord, that do the same, that preach and teach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, come to save unworthy sinners like us, Father, and who, Lord, believe in the Bible as being your word of truth. Lord, we pray this morning that you will help us to understand, to be enlightened by, to be illuminated by the scriptures, your word, that you will show us, Lord, how to put these truths into practice in our lives as individuals, in our lives as a church body. And Lord, we pray all of this in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So last week, I began by giving you a job description. And the job description, if you remember, was from an 1860s newspaper in San Francisco. And the, uh, the ad, the, it was a wanted ad for a job, and you might remember, it, it read like this. It was a call for young, skinny, wiry fellows not over 18, must be expert writers, willing to risk daily orphans preferred. And if you remember, that was for what? The Pony Express, exactly. Now, I was thinking about this this week because while this ad gives some qualifications for the job, it doesn't really clearly tell you what the job is. So if I did this and I shared with you another job description, see if you might understand what this job is. For this job, you'll need a special license. You will work long hours and various shifts, including late evenings, nights, weekends, and holidays. You must work safely in all weather conditions, and you will deal with a wide range of people for low wages and tips, which can cause high stress levels. Sounds like a lot of jobs, doesn't it? That would be a taxi driver. A taxi driver. Here's one last one. This job often requires you to live away from home for prolonged periods of time away from your family. Your life is often put in danger while you are trying to serve others. The pay is not great, and there are stressful situations and difficult working conditions, especially in a combat zone. That kind of gives it away more. A military soldier. <clears throat> well, this morning... I want us to dive deeper in the area of an elder's role. We had looked at some qualifications last time, and we'll get to some more qualifications. But we, we, we talked about this uh, two weeks ago, and I, I just became convicted that we need to, to flesh out this idea of an elder's role uh, a little bit more because we can learn all about the qualifications of an elder, but kind of what good is that if we aren't crystal clear on the role of an elder? What does an elder actually do? What is the purpose of an elder? And so with that this morning, I'm going to give you one big overarching purpose, and then we'll have, oh, six uh, sub-purposes under that for elders in leading the local church. So with that, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Titus, <clears throat> Titus chapter 1, verse 5, and why don't you go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. Just please remember that Titus and Paul have already traveled through this island of Crete, and they have been establishing churches there. Paul has since gone on to Macedonia, and he has uh, left Titus behind, but he has written now this letter to Titus, telling him this, beginning in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion." For the overseer must be above reproach, as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, but pugna not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, 
so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. This is the word of God. You may be seated. So we kicked off three weeks ago with Paul's salutation here in verses 1 to 4 where we learn several characteristics of the local church. And then we hit verse 5 and then we just kind of stopped here for the last couple of messages and for this week as well before we press on with the rest of the qualifications that we see in verses 6 to 9. In fact, we are using this whole text from 5 to 9 as a, a series for biblical leadership and especially pertaining to the biblical office of elder. And just by way of reminder, so far we have learned that elder, pastor, overseer, these are all one in the same office. The most common title in the Bible is elder, and so that's what we have been calling this office, the office of elder. Um, It is to also be an office made up of a plurality, more than one elders, all sharing the weight and responsibilities of ministry. We also learned the office of elder does not just have to be um, paid professional pastors, if you will, or vocational pastors, but we think it wise to include qualified persons from the membership. And while there are a few main views of church polity, which we talked about last week, there is one that we believe to be the most biblical, again, a plurality of elder leaders. And then last week in 1 Timothy uh, 3, 1, we went there and saw the calling of an elder, which comprises four things, that they have to be a man, they have to aspire or desire the office, they, they need to understand that it is a fine work, it is a even noble and high calling, and it is also a labor-intensive work. That's kind of like those job descriptions without telling you quite what the job is. And then a couple of weeks ago, I presented to you uh, with three terms that the New Testament uses to describe this office of church leader. Again, there's that Greek word presbyteros, uh, which is elder, and and denotes uh, spiritual maturity in that role of leadership. There's episkopos, which means overseer, which talks more about giving direction or oversight in the church. And then there's poimeno, which is pastor or shepherd, which is more about the care of the flock, the care of the local church. And it's this last term that I want us to focus on just more in-depthly this morning in exploring this role of elder. So that's kind of our overarching our overarching uh, piece then, which is about shepherding the flock. Shepherding the flock. And that has to do with pastoral care. The pastoral care of the flock. In Acts 20 and verse 28, and I've, I know I've read a lot of these passages to you already over the last few weeks, but I will keep reminding you of some of them. This is Paul speaking to those Ephesian elders when he says to them, Be on guard. For yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. If you will, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And remember here in this text, this book, that the Apostle Peter is writing to those Christians that have been dispersed throughout different parts of the Roman Empire. And they have come under persecution. They have come under persecution because the Roman Emperor Nero has burned down Rome, and then guess what he did? He blamed it on the Christians. And so, of course, now the Christians are under fire and people are not liking the Christians. And Peter uh, realizes this and he wants to write to them these churches that have been spread out. And uh, he wants to offer them encouragement and he wants to strengthen. And he knows that he needs to start with the leaders of those local churches, the elders, that they then would be good examples for their local bodies, for their flocks. He says this in 1 Peter chapter 5. In verses 1 to 3. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, 
not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. So in both of these passages, we see that the primary aspect of overseeing a local church body really is to shepherd it, to shepherd it. But what does that mean exactly to shepherd the local flock? Thankfully, this shepherd motif is a popular one throughout the scriptures where it's used of God as well as his son in relationship to us. In Psalm 23, which we read this morning, it's a classic example of where God, as our shepherd, if you you remember from reading it this morning, provides for our needs, gives us rest, feeds and waters us, gives restoration to our souls, spiritual guidance. He walks with us through the most difficult of times, helps us not to fear, gives us comfort, disciplines us, protects us from our enemies, blesses us with more than we deserve, including his goodness and kindness every day of our lives, and then finally promises that we will be with him forever. That is... A good shepherd, a very good shepherd. Now Jesus is also called the good shepherd, is he not? In relation to us being his sheep, for instance, in John 10, verses 14 to 15, he says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And again, friends, we are the sheep. And so let us consider the role of a shepherd in the context, again, of elders shepherding the people of God within the local church. And we'll do so through six aspects of shepherding. The first is this, leading the flock. Elders are to lead the flock as shepherds. Sheep need to be led. They don't always know where they're going. If you let them out of the sheepfold in the morning uh, and, and, and they can't just kind of naturally go and find the green pastures, and even if they did, they wouldn't necessarily be able to get themselves back to the sheepfold come evening. They, they need a human guide. And the shepherd will also search for any lost sheep and bring them home. There is a wonderful little book called Minister as Shepherd. It was the first book I read in seminary and probably the one that was even most impactful. It was written by a 20th century pastor and author by the name of Charles Jefferson who shepherded the flock at Broadway Tabernacle in New York City for 40 years. And he wrote this, quote, A sheep will keep his nose to the ground and following the strip of greenest grass, little by little separating himself from his companions until at last his companions completely are out of sight, the poor isolated animal does not know where he is. When once he realizes his lost condition, he is furious to find his fellows. He cannot live alone. He was made for society." When by himself he is timorous and easily panic-stricken, every sight alarms him, every sound makes him afraid, he rushes hither and thither seeking his way, but his search is generally fruitless. A lost sheep does not get home. The more he tries to find his path, the farther he is likely to be from the fold. In his desperation, he may run into a thicket or sink into a, a morass. I had to look that up. Swamp, marsh, okay? or fall into a pit and there perish unless the shepherd finds him, end quote. We find another aspect of leading the flock, shepherding the flock in 1 Timothy 5, 17, where it says the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor. And this word for rule there means to lead, direct, or manage. Titus 1 and verse 7, when we get there, talks about how elders are to be above reproach as God's 
steward. A steward, friends, is a household manager. And back then it was somebody with responsibility over the whole house. They were, they were over servants and they were over property and even finances. And as we've said, the word for overseer, that episkopos word, also has this same connotation, that of someone who supervises or manages the church. According to the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, the elders then are to demonstrate their management skills by first managing their own homes as well. That's kind of the, the training ground. And so elders are stewards and overseers then of God's household, the local church, to direct and manage the affairs of the local church. Alexander Strzok, uh, author of a popular book called Biblical Eldership, writes this. He says, quote, a congregation needs leadership, management, government, guidance, counsel, and vision. The eldership must clarify direction and beliefs for the flock. It must set goals, make decisions, give direction, correct failures, affect change, and motivate people. It must evaluate, plan, and govern. Elders then are problem solvers, managers of people, planners, and thinkers, end quote. And I might add that shepherding and leading is basically a 24-7 kind of job. And as I mentioned last week, it is hard work. It is not for the lazy and the idle. And this can be a problem. This can be a problem as we're looking, we, Calvary Bible, but other churches as well, look for qualified men to lead in the church because generally speaking, and just to be blunt, men more than women can be spiritually lazy. It's true. And this can be a huge problem in the church. And it can be a problem as to why some churches kind of deflect from going this eldership, leadership kind of route. Men are far too often willing to let someone else fulfill their spiritual role in the church, be it women or even church professionals. Well, we'll just, we'll just hire more pastors and let them kind of be the elders. It's sad, but it's true. I was, I'll be honest, I was all ready to stand up here and give you uh, some statistics about how even at Calvary Bible Church there are more spiritually minded women than men. And I thought, well, you know what, I need to really understand if this is true. And so I did a little survey this week based on our current midweek Bible study attendance. I am happy to report, while we have about 55% of our women here at Calvary Bible involved in a midweek study, we have about 50% of our men. That's pretty close, and, and I do. I praise God for those close numbers. However, with God's call specifically for men to lead the local church, I would pray that those numbers would be a bit higher. Men. We have to be ready and willing to fulfill our God-given spiritual responsibility to lead his flock. The spiritual health of this church, along with God's blessing and God's glory, are at stake. Secondly, elders need to be feeding the flock. They need to be feeding the flock. Sheep need to be fed, right? I mean, the grass varies with the seasons, and it's the shepherd who knows where to take the sheep for the best and most abundant pastures. When not fed properly, the, the sheep will become emaciated, they will get sick, they will even die. Likewise with water, so much of the water in the Middle East is down below ground, and so it would require shepherds to know where the wells are. They would have to be the one to actually draw the water out of the well for the sheep to drink. And it will be the shepherd who even knows where the seasonal streams are. But what does the flock in the church need to feed on? What do the scriptures say? 
Well, Jesus told Peter in John 21, verses 15 to 17, to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. We're also told in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 20, to long for the pure milk of the word. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 2, Paul uses the metaphor of milk and solid food when speaking about the word of God. And in Psalm 1, streams of water are equated with the law of the Lord as that which causes growth and produces fruit. So yes, it's the word of God that we are to be fed, which in one sense requires somebody to do the feeding, which we would call a teacher, right? Elders are to Feed people the word of God by teaching it to them. This is also part of the qualifications that we will see in Titus 1 and verse 9. That elders need to be holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching. So that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So really two key purposes there, right? To uh, exhort in sound doctrine... The, the doctrine of the scriptures, the Bible, but then also to be able to refute those who contradict. When, when those things are, are brought up or said or spoken within the context of a local church that, that would contradict the scriptures, the elders need to be ready and willing and able to step in and say, no, no, it doesn't say that. It doesn't mean that. That is incorrect. And in Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 2, it just says that they are to be able to teach. Uh, this is what the Old Testament saints like Ezra did, as recorded in Ezra 7 and verse 10, when it says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. His, meaning the Lord's statutes and ordinances. And, and what did the people, even some of the Pharisees, call Jesus? They called him rabbi, didn't they? Teacher, teacher, because this was Jesus' primary job while he was here on this earth prior to his death and resurrection. This is what the disciples and all of the apostles did. They taught the people the word of God. Paul said to the Ephesian elders again in Acts 20, verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. And of course, this includes preaching as well. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, which has Paul saying, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction and at the center of this preaching and teaching surprise surprise it's the gospel right it's the good news the good news of jesus christ as we've already heard this morning it's been shared that we are the sinners and we need a savior because our sins have consequences our sins have the consequence of death and our sins have the consequence of hell and the eternal lake of fire But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And when we would put our faith and our hope and our trust in the Lord Jesus to save us, he saves us, he forgives us, he gives us that tremendous promise of eternal life. And of course, once he died on the cross, On our behalf, his body goes into the ground dead, three days later resurrects. So indeed, we know this is true. We know he is God. We know he is the one who can offer forgiveness of sins. And he is the one who grants eternal life because indeed he has eternal life. Secondly, the scriptures then are all about for then us as believers our sanctification, right? It's, it's how we grow in Christ-likeness. The scriptures are what mature us in the faith. And, and they are what teaches us about the church and God's kingdom purposes and about spreading the gospel. And so, friends, it is the word of God. It is the word of God that feeds and waters and makes us healthy and strong, just like that tree planted by the streams of water in Psalm 1 that would bear fruit, that would not wither, and in which we will have the ability to prosper. 
Now we will talk more about some of the specific qualifications of being able to teach when we get there. But suffice it to say that teaching God's word to the people, showing the people how to apply it to their lives, is the predominant way that elders are to feed and water the flock. They are to preach and teach the spirit-empowered word and thereby protect and guide and lead and nourish and comfort and educate and heal the flock. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. It's nothing that we take lightly. Thirdly, third aspect of shepherding that we want to focus on this morning from the scriptures is caring for the flock. Caring for the flock. Sheep must also have somebody generally care for them, help to provide for their needs, whatever those needs may be. If one of the sheep gets hurt, the shepherd is there to put salve on the wound or to bandage the wound or even if they must carry the critter if it has a broken leg or is otherwise crippled. Each congregation along with its individual members will of course have many different and diverse needs that the elders have responsibility towards. For instance, if anyone in the flock is sick or weak, James says that they are to call on the elders for prayer. The Ephesian elders were exhorted by Paul to help the weak. The one who cares for the flock will know well the flock. They will know of the needs of the people. They will know of their sensitivities and their troubles and their weaknesses and their sins. Strzok again writes, quote, He knows how they can hurt for one another. Uh, excuse me. He knows how they can hurt one another. He knows how stubborn they can be. He knows how to deal with people. He knows they must be slowly and patiently led. He knows when to be tough and when to be gentle. He knows people's needs and what must be done to meet those needs. He knows how to accurately assess the health and direction of the congregation. And when he doesn't know these things, he is quick to find answers, end quote. Elders must do things like Pray for the needs of you, the body, and visit the sick and infirmed and comfort the emotionally hurting and help to strengthen the weak and help keep tabs on on our senior saints and widows and widowers and follow up with new folks in the church. And Elders need to provide counsel for those that are struggling with The problems of life, both great and small. And elders must also care for those sheep that maybe even bite a little. Those that might be a little bit more difficult to deal with. Obviously, I'm talking about sheep in other parts of the country, not, not, not anywhere around here. Elders must also care for the flock by calling attention to sin. And confronting when necessary. They must care for the day-to-day details and affairs of the inner life of the congregation. Fourthly, fourthly, the fourth aspect is protecting the flock. Protecting the flock. The sheep must be protected because the sheep have many enemies. There are predators, things like wolves and other wild animals They are not always aware when danger is lurking, and frankly, they have no real means of defense. Even when in the sheepfold, their their corral, their place of what should be safety, they still need to be guarded. We realized this when we were living up in canyon country, and we had our chickens. Some of you got to know our chickens, and we had uh, our chicken coop, and there was even hawk netting on the top of the chicken coop. And the next thing you know... Some critter gets in there and two of our chickens are gone. So we put the game cameras up, right? And we got this unreal picture of a bobcat walking on the top of the, uh, the hawk netting. 
just serving, looking to see below what his next meal would be. And then real, come to realize there was this little, little space that I didn't think, uh, you know, a bobcat could get in or out of or get a chicken in and out of, for that matter. And so now, you know, after that, then the, the coop became like the uh, Fort Knox of chicken coops. You know, I put up wire everywhere. Nobody was getting in or out. But even in the sheepfold, they have to be guarded. Yes, even here in the church, the sheep have to be guarded. Philip Keller uh, was a man who um, was a shepherd and agricultural researcher in East Africa and Canada, writing from his own experiences of sheep being under attack from dogs, cougars, bears, and even wolves, uh, says this, often in blind fear or stupid awareness, they will stand rooted to the spot, watching their companions being cut to shreds. The predator will pounce upon one and then another of the flock, raking and tearing them tooth and claw. Meanwhile, the other sheep may act as if they did not even hear or recognize the carnage going on around them. It is as though they were totally oblivious to the peril of their own precarious situation, end quote. We might add that sheep also need protection from things like thieves, robbers, even difficult terrain. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Acts 20. Acts 20. That passage that we looked at part of uh, in verses 28 to 31. But again, Acts 20, beginning in verse 28. Paul with the Ephesian elders. This is uh, when he stopped in Miletus on his way to Jerusalem and called together the Ephesian elders to come and see him one last time, and he very pointedly exhorted them in Acts 20, verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves. Uh, That word savage there means afflicting, violent, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Just Notice five quickie things here about protecting the people of God. One, elders are not just to guard the people, but also they are to guard themselves. Because they are also, we are also prone to danger. Secondly, what the elder is guarding, it has to be understood, it is extremely important. It is very valuable to the one that owns the sheep. You. You, friends, you, because Jesus purchased you. God purchased you, I should say, with the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. Thirdly, it is not even probable but inevitable that these savage wolves, those outside the local church, will come in. And when they come in, they will not spare the flock. They're not going to try to pick off one and be satisfied. They're going to come in and wreak havoc, carnage, if they can. Not sparing the flock. They will try and rip and tear the flock to shreds. Fourthly, there will be predators that will arise from even within the church. I know that sounds strange. I know that sounds horrible. But it's the truth. And they will try and draw away its followers. Coyotes do this. Right? They kind of pick their prey and they try to kind of get their prey off from the rest of the group, from the herd, if you will. And, and, and then they kind of circle around and attack. And fifthly, elders need to be on the alert, meaning never letting our guard down. We must stay vigilant, guardians over the sheep. Now, Who or what are these predators today? And how should they be dealt with by the elders? Well, in the New Testament, we understand these people to be, quote, 
false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That's Matthew 7 and verse 15. They are also described as false prophets and teachers, quote, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, 2 Peter 2, 1. They are men teaching strange doctrines, 1 Timothy 1, 3. Those who will mislead many, Matthew 24, 11. Even the elect, verse 24, and they will try to lead astray, Mark 13, 22, other believers, Satan himself tried this with Jesus to get him to change his allegiances from God to him. Now, who are some of these false teachers that we battle with today? What are some of these false teachings that we are at war with today? Well, outside the church, it's everything from world religions, things like Islam and Buddhism to atheism and evolution to ideologies that promote things like abortion, LGBTQ+, gender issues. It can be aberrant Christian groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism, even Catholicism. It can be someone off the street that tries to get you to believe in their own made-up brand of religion inside the church It can be those using Christianity for their own sordid gain, be it financial or pride-oriented. There can be those that seek to promote their own kinds of unbiblical agendas to draw some away or cause disunity or bring about factions in the church. And what is an elder's best weapon for protecting the congregation yeah, I know you know what it is. It's the same for us as it is, it is for you. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This was Jesus' um, weapon of warfare against Satan. And you think if it was good enough for Jesus, right? Battle Satan, it's certainly good enough for us. And that's why elders are told in Titus that they must hold fast. The faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Protecting the flock is also about going after lost or straying members. It can involve disciplining sin, admonishing ungodly behavior or attitudes, putting a halt to infighting and conflict. And as 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, admonishing the unruly, encouraging the faint-hearted, helping the weak, and being patient with everyone. Therefore, the elders must be men of the word, solid in their own walks, spiritually alert, prayerful over the congregation, and absolutely unflinchingly courageous for battle. This is much easier done when the elders actually have a true love for the flock. And that's our sixth aspect, loving the flock. Loving the flock. Charles Jefferson, again, from the Minister of Shepherd book, suggests that being a shepherd who loves his flock has been demonstrated to a greater degree by those shepherds in the Middle East where, as he says... The solitude of those eastern lands created wondrous intimacies between animal and human life. Man and beast linked together by ties beautiful and sacred. There sprang up in the sheep a fondness for the shepherd and in the shepherd an affection for the sheep which were displayed in many ways. End quote. Friends, if you despise warm, fuzzy, gamey-smelling animals that make bang sounds and tend to stray and often aren't the brightest bulb in the box, then shepherding sheep is probably not for you. Elders, however, must love all the people placed in their care, warts and all. And I'll be the first one to say, plenty of warts, plenty of warts. They must fervently love their flocks, 
talk to their flocks, listen to their flocks, be involved with the flocks. They must show genuine compassion and caring. They must have a, a sacrificial attitude towards the flock and at least metaphorically speaking be willing to lay down their life for them in other words they should be ready and willing to go to great lengths for you the flock john 15 and verse 9 has jesus saying to his disciples just as the father has loved me i have also loved you Abide in my love. And then in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. In other words, the love that any of us have for one another comes from the fact that God first loved us. That his son Jesus loved us. Therefore, we can love anyone and everyone and and that's like i said that is something that the elders must indeed do turn in your bibles to first corinthians chapter 13 you know this passage well first corinthians 13 <clears throat> i'm going to start in chapter one uh, excuse me cha uh, verse one 1 Corinthians 13. And, and this is that classic love passage, right? And oftentimes we put ourselves in there, right? And, and, um, and we're thinking about how we should be this way. Well, for this reading of it, I want you to think about it in the context of elders. If we as elders are doing this, what, what this would mean for us as your leaders. Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Think about that from an elder context, right? Yeah, we can preach and we can teach, and man, we, we can just be nailing the scriptures and, and all this, you know, knowledge and whatnot coming out of us but if we don't show you love it's going to be all for nothing all for nothing he says in verse three and if i give all my possessions to feed the poor and if i surrender my body to be burned but do not have love it profits me nothing in other words our our ministries would be for naught. verse four love is patient Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As, as much as I would exhort that that needs to be you all, that needs to be from your elders as well in how they love you, the flock. Again, Jefferson writes, this was the crowning virtue of the shepherd, his self-sacrificing love. Christ demonstrated this love, Paul demonstrated this love, and of course, certainly the elders should demonstrate this kind of love. Well, that leads us to our, our last one this morning, serving the flock, serving the flock. I think I said six earlier, I meant seven, sorry. Seven, serving the flock, leading, feeding, caring for, protecting, and loving the flock all fall under this, this kind of bigger banner of serving the flock. In fact, we've, we've come to call this servant leadership because that's what we see in the scriptures but i would suggest to you that what is equally important about being a servant leader and again this is scriptural is the heart attitude behind it because a shepherd of sheep they're a hired hand right they're serving not just the sheep but the owner and and truth is when they're out there in the fields and the owner's not around i guess they can have whatever kind of attitude they would like to have as long as the owner and the sheep are served and the work gets done. It's not quite the same way for the elder. 
Because the owner is always observing what is going on with his sheep. The elder over Christ church, mere servant leadership is simply not enough. But it's what we see displayed in the Lord himself as humble servant leadership. That is what is all the more important. And of course, the classic example we again have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We see that example play out when he washed the disciples' feet, which just sent such a crystal clear message of how they were to humbly be servant leaders. In Mark 10, verses 42 to 45, Mark writes this, Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, talking to the disciples, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Or as Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8 tells us, he, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So as we wrap up this morning, friends, I, I, I want you to notice something about many, if not even most, of these passages that we looked at today. We, we often consider them, well today we considered them in the, the context of as elders, shepherds, but many of these passages apply to who? You. The sheep. Yes, the elders are responsible for the shepherding and care of the whole church. But we are not the total ministry of the church. That would be all of us as well. This is still one body made up of many different spirit-gifted members that all bear some responsibility for shepherding one another. And so my charge to you this morning is to consider how we, your elders here at Calvary Bible Church, do in these seven areas. And believe me, we will do the same examining ourselves. And if you see an area that you think we could use some work on, please, please humbly share that with us. And we promise to humbly receive it. But then also ask of yourself the question, how, how am I participating in or not in whatever a lay person may be called to do in, again, these areas of leading, feeding, caring, protecting, loving, serving. I think my count is off somewhere in there. I don't know, six or seven, whatever it is. Let's just pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for being our great shepherd, for the Lord Jesus being our great shepherd. We learn by example, I pray, as elders. We learn by example as congregation members, church members. Lord, help us as the elders of Calvary Bible Church to, Lord, fulfill well these different aspects of being a shepherd to your flock help all of us as members of that flock also to lord where appropriate um, do these things as well we pray all of this in your son jesus's name amen